All right, <coughs> gents, uh, when you're ready, let's get underway. Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is a special edition of the Acquirers podcast. We're talking to business leaders about what they're seeing in their business. We'll be talking to them right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquirers Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquirers Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquirers Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit AcquiresFunds.com. Hello, gents. Thanks so much for joining us. I'll start with Jesse uh, Coltis. Jesse, can you tell us your name? What do you do? And uh, what's your business? Yeah, uh, good to be on, Toby. My name is Jesse Coltis. I'm the uh, co-founder and operator of Lona Life. We are a grocery goods business, consumer packaged goods that sell dry soups into grocery stores in the United States. Where are you based? Uh, Oceanside, California. And uh, Scott, how about you? Thanks, Toby. Great to be on. Uh, Scott Belzenthal is my name. I'm executive vice president of a business called Whitmore. We're a fourth generation family owned business. We uh, uh, design, manufacture and distribute home storage and organization products to the retail sector uh, based in Memphis, Tennessee. Thank you. Ariel? Okay. How are you? I'm Ariel Barbut. Uh, Our company is Nuchas. We're based in New Jersey and New York City. Right now, I'm actually right across the river from New York City. We make handheld foods, empanadas, if you want to call them. Um, We have locations at the Javits in Times Square. We sell to airlines. We have a location at the (laughs) convention center in Atlanta, and we're figuring this out. (laughs) And uh, John, how about you? Uh, Thanks, Toby. My name is John Swallow. I'm the CEO of New Jersey Mining Company. We're uh, based in North Idaho. Our corporate office is actually in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. We're a junior gold producer, so we're kind of uh, a bit of a unicorn out there in the gold production industry. Uh, Just starting back with Jesse, can you tell us a little bit about what impact you've seen so far on your business? Yeah, so this this has been the craziest two-week period in the last five years for us. Um, So we sell dry bone broth. It's a dry soup product. And typically, there's a lot of seasonality. You know, the winter is higher and the summer is lower. And so we were already at the winter peak. And then over the last week, we've sold, you know, 50% more than we did the week before. And we've gotten inbound calls from Costco saying, anything you can make, we'll buy, Um, which has really never happened before in the five-year history of our business. And uh, how how about you, Scott? Yeah, it's interesting. So we're in the retail sector and the jury's still kind of out on how how the retail industry is going to respond to to all this from a brick and mortar perspective, but also an online perspective. Obviously, the online business is doing very well through our retail partners like Amazon and others. Um, But what is yet to be determined is really the presence of the brick and mortars and our chains going to close for periods of times across the country. And what's that going to mean for reorders uh, from our perspective? Um, so there's really no playbook. We're just we're doing the best we can and trying to figure that out as as we go. Thank you, Ariel. So um, for us, it's been crazy for a while now. We're actually located one of our retail locations is in the middle of Times Square. Usually the winters are not that great, uh, but we started noticing the the slowdown and at the same time, everybody on the same subway. So there's many many factors at at stake here. It's not only who, what are we doing? But, you know, it's our people, our team. So on the retail side, all our retail operations have been shut down. Uh, well, that being said, we're still getting phone calls from airlines until last week. We were sending samples to some of the largest airlines. Uh, people are still prepared, like this is going to go away fast. Uh, we are doing a lot more sales to Whole Foods and a lot of these places. We're actually launching our direct to consumer website, which we had ready for a while, but just we're going to launch tomorrow or Wednesday uh, just to get people out there and be able to get our products out there. There's plenty of demand. We're playing it day by day. We're doing a production, but we're looking at production not on a weekly basis now, but on a daily basis because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if if tomorrow they tell us keep working or they shall say shut down. We don't know. Thank you. Uh, how about you, John? You know, ours is a, our industry is a little bit different in that there's been a market for gold for about 2,000 years. So, and, and actually, that's one of the reasons why when I chose to get back in the industry, um, I wanted to go straight into the gold market. 
I've got other business interests, so um, this was sort of my way of also diversifying. But I've said for a long time I didn't want to be held to the whims of a teenager and an iPhone. And so, uh, and plus I know this industry and I know our area really well. Our, our biggest challenge now, um, our biggest challenge is actually building the business. And now that we're where we're at, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. Now it's keeping people safe, doing the right thing doing what's best for the communities and that kind of thing. But one of the things that I'm really hoping comes out of this is that everybody starts to understand how dependent we are on foreign sources of everything. So I'm, I'm really, really hoping that this makes it through, you know, as unscathed as possible, but also opens everybody's eyes a bit. What, what does that imply, John, that you, you, you would like to see some more uh, domestic production? Yeah, I'd say, you know, one of the one of the things you notice in our industry, too, is, uh, you know, again, we live here, we work here. It's we actually put out a press release this morning that kind of crystallized our thoughts on kind of how we're handling everything. But if you really think about, you know, when the environmental side came after kind of with a broad brushstroke and tried to wipe out all mining, all that did is it just shut it down the U.S. and kicked it overseas. It didn't get rid of it. And so then you basically exported any kind of um, environmental impacts to a different country, which was even worse. You know, I always said, look, we can we can operate, just keep the goalposts steady and let's do it right and responsible, but don't remove the goalposts, you know? So that's really what I see. And I and one of the things to look at is, you know, we actually ship our concentrates. Um, we create a gold concentrate. We get paid by a concentrate broker at our mill. And then that concentrates actually gets shipped over to either Japan, South Korea, Germany, or China. Um, because there aren't the smells in the US that can process it. So right there, you can go all the way to the very end of your product and you're still beholden to like the last little piece is that piece to go overseas. And there's people that have tried to permit smelters in the US and do it in a responsible way and can't get approvals. Does anybody else have uh, international inputs into their business? We do. We, um, from a manufacturing perspective, obviously we're we're international, a majority being in China. And I think John's exactly right. When when a moment like the last few weeks surface, uh, we quickly realize how connected the world can be. Um, and for us, it's been we've had to deal with tariff issues the past year. Uh, we've had actually a flood at our office. We kind of had to overcome, and then we finally kind of get uh, settled down and all of a sudden the the coronavirus hits so we're 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 doing a lot of things and trying to be be human with our employees we're not trying to be the type of people that um you know we know exactly how to handle this because we don't um and i don't think any of us do uh, but we're just trying to be humans and, and be very empathetic and, and taking care of our our staff and our team and and ultimately that's what um, benefits the company in the end but that's that's kind of the challenges we're we're dealing with um, from an international supply chain perspective. Now, China's, as everybody's heard, China's kind of on the other side of all this now. So they're, they are starting to ship uh, very consistently uh, products to us. Um, but the problem now is the slowdown that potentially is coming on our end. So that, that side of the supply chain's fixed, but it's kind of uh, in our hands now as to, to what happens from here. Um, so interesting times. Um, on our end, food comes from all over the place. We source everything here. We buy nothing from China, but everything is affected. Our spices come from all over the world. Uh, we're still a small manufacturer, but we're growing a lot. We do deal with international airlines, and uh, I've actually started listening to this as it unfold while we're working with a Korean airline for the past four months, and I worked through the whole progression of, you know, this is, we had a presentation on January 3rd, uh, for this airline, we shipped product, they tested it, they liked it. As a matter of fact, today I got the the boxes that they were planning to use. And at this point, I was like, I don't know what to do with it. But uh, people are still working like all of this is going to go away soon, which is great. It's going to take a while. And supplies change here, even with all the meat and everything that we buy here and vegetables, everything is going to get affected at some point or another. And, and it's a short game. It, it completely changed the way we look at everything for a while. Jesse, what are you seeing on a sort of customer and supplier front? Um, on a supplier front, one of the most interesting things I've heard of is um, basically what's happening at the national level now is what happens regionally in the southeast during hurricane season. 
So the way food gets to grocery stores, typically, if you're not a very large supplier, is it goes through a distributor like K here or UNFI. And in hurricane season in the southeast, when a town like New Orleans gets hit by a hurricane, they change how they supply the grocery stores. And they start giving primacy to things like toilet paper, water, that sort of thing. That's happening all over the United States right now. And it's unclear to me um, how much of these secondary goods are going to be slowed down getting into grocery stores across the nation. Right now, I was in New York City. It looks like the grocery stores look pretty good. But given that the whole nation is on, is on this hurricane footing right now, it'll be interesting to see what they look like in two weeks. Scott, uh, what, what are you seeing from a customer and supplier perspective? Uh, we're seeing from the supplier side, we're, we're doing okay now because of what I mentioned earlier with China and, and other countries um, in, on the Asia side that are kind of on the, on the down cycle, I guess, of the, of, of the curve that everybody's talking about. Um, from a retail partner perspective, uh, we hear a little bit more every day. Um, some customers are beginning to close stores for a period of time. Some obviously aren't because the demand has been unbelievable, like Walmart and Target and others, mostly consumable products. But um, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how this dynamic changes the continues to have the, the evolution of the retail world um, and how this as it opens our eyes, what's it going to do to the retail sector uh, yet to be determined? You, you agreeing there, Ariel? Yeah, it's it, it, it's a big concern. My my biggest concern will still be supplier vendors. It's it's our people. It's really how everybody's going to do on on March thirty first, and and the more people are concerned about what's going to happen with the rents on March thirty first, the harder it's going to be for anybody to think straight. That's kind of my my biggest thing. But we we've been preparing for this for a few weeks, uh, but people need to start thinking straight, and they can't think of what the government is saying today, but and worrying about the end of the month. We need to just stay home. John, and what are you? So, I'm yeah, sorry. Sure. Sorry, Ari, I'll finish that thought. No, that's fine. I'm good. John, what are you seeing from a supplier or customer perspective? You know, we're, <clears throat> well, <laughs> being located in North Idaho and, and um, being in a mining community where the, our folks have, uh, they're fairly resilient third and fourth generation people. They've been through strikes. They've been through, you know, one of the biggest things that I compare this to when I was a kid was the eruption of Mount St. Helens. That shut down North Idaho for a couple of months, the highways, everything. And so, you know, I, I find myself taking bits and pieces of different things and fitting them into this. And I guess... Now that I'm a little older, now I've got enough experience to be able to fit a lot of it together. But, um, you know, we one of the things is we built the business. We made sure we had redundancy built into the systems and that kind of thing. Um, and we make sure everybody's responsible for what they do. And a lot of that makes sure that when we hit a situation of a supply shortage of anything, if it's concentrate bags or drill bits or anything like that, that we're covered. So we... We kind of already naturally run that way. I'm not trying to be any cavalier at all about it. I just said we kind of do that because when you run a small business, if any one little part of it goes away, your profit margins are toast. So the and one of the things that I you know I'm, I, it's kind of good for us is we right now our main customer for shipping our concentrate is uh, Sumitomo in Japan, and those folks have actually started to come out the other side of the curve. So while we saw a little bit of a delay, it. You know, I'm feeling comfortable about, comfortable about that. But what I'm looking at now is I've got this checklist of when we built the business, as we're building the business, and I guarantee you I'm going to be addressing uh, <laughs> the, the, the milling and processing of our concentrate in case this ever happens again. So you're, you're looking to bring some of that onto, you're, you're going to do that yourself rather than shipping it? Absolutely. Yeah, and a few weeks ago, I actually got a hold of the Russ Fulcher congressman in Idaho and actually the uh, county commissioners. And, you know, really, I took it as an opportunity to introduce our business and actually tell them what impact we we are to the community. Like I always figure that, you know, the best job to get is pretty much the one you save. And so really talk to them about that and how we can actually um, adjust going forward. Jesse, how about you? How, how are you reacting? What are you, uh, what are you planning to change, if anything? Yeah, it's yeah, it's a really interesting thing. Um, just in time kind of goes out the window when 
when uh, sales go up 50% from a high. So just in times looking less and less intelligent when you're trying to pull forward inventories for the whole of 2020 into the, the end of the first quarter. Um, and really that's all we're doing. I mean, our plan is to max production now really with, without hesitation. Our main concern is that social distancing is going to end up in our food factories. And if you're socially distanced in a food factory, you can't produce. So we're just pedal to the metal on trying to build inventory as fast as we can while we can. Scott, yeah. any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, and I really kind of want to pose a question to these guys because it's something we're working through as well from a, our corporate offices attached to our, our warehouse. And, and I know you guys have distribution uh, operations up there as well. So as as we're encouraging a lot of employees to stay at home, you clearly cannot do that with the, the warehouse piece of the business. Um, so you kind of addressed that a second ago. But any other thoughts there for me all on how you're kind of handling those two groups of employees? If I can. Um, I've, I've been having conversations with our team uh, every week. It's not about what they do with us, but it's what they do at home, where they go, and the same conversations uh, about what are your activities. I even had a conversation with the USDA inspector I, a few times last week. I got him in the office and I said, listen, nobody's coming to our, into our facility that we don't know. You're the only person. Uh, I need you to be extra careful. I need you to be extra careful when you go home. It's creating awareness of everything, creating awareness with our own families. My parents live overseas. Uh, I mean, they're older. And at this point, everything that people are that taking care of do is affecting them. So if my brother is going to be helping them, my brother kind of needs to stay in too. So we need to change the mentality with everyone. So uh, what I'm telling our people is, listen, we can keep going like crazy. These are good times for manufacturing food. But everybody needs to come in clean. And the first time this fails, they're going to shut us all down too. It's social distancing. And as soon as the virus walks into the facility, it's going to be a problem. So we're implementing whatever. Every 15 minutes, somebody going around. Nobody comes in with a cold, but that is not enough. Nobody can come in. I call our printer today because that's also a concern. We're starting direct to consumer. It's fantastic. But if my printer does not protect himself, I'm out of labels. So what are they doing? And they're not doing much. And it's like, well, close the door, put a sign, one client at a time. We need to educate a lot of people. The larger suppliers know what they're doing. The smaller ones, we need to work a little closer, I think. And that's, that's going to be our focus. Jesse? Yeah, one thing that's happening, which is amazing, is there's been a lot of phone calls between food manufacturing quality people this week and last week. And there's kind of a, a homebrew Chinese system coming up about measuring the temperature of some food workers before they come into your plant, in addition to banning everybody that's not totally critical to being there. But I think we're all trying to get ahead and think, where is this going to be in two weeks? Are we going to be doing temperature monitoring? And we're already seeing that in some of our facilities. John, are you doing any, have you implemented anything like that? Is there any work from home or? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, it's really hard to mine from home. So <laughs> it's, uh, and a lot of our guys, they're very small communities around here. So it, it really, really has to start at home and taking care of themselves and their families so that then they can go to work. Um, a lot of the guys have told me that they actually feel safer going to work as opposed to being I don't want to say stuck at home, but at home. Um, and not that a home's not safe, but I know these guys, they'll be out doing stuff. And that's just how they, how they roll. So as far as that goes, we've just been really, really diligent to make sure that they know, you know, the business is in good shape. We've got their backs. If they're sick, stay home. Don't worry about PTO and all this, you know, just kind of letting them know that, that we're there. Um, and the, the usual wash your hands. Face, I mean, all of that stuff. I hate, don't try to, not trying to dismiss it, but everybody knows that stuff by now. Um, so yeah, it's really just kind of sticking with it. And and if there's any any things are going to evolve and businesses are going to change coming out the other side, and really that's what I'm focused on myself and and our guys. I mean that's we're we want to be prepared for uh, for the future, and hopefully we can leverage off of this and and do real well. Scott, did you have something you wanted to add before? No, I didn't. That was. Great response, John. I just have a question about, without putting too fine a point on it, whether you're worried about survival or not. And for the food guys who look like, it looks like you've, you're pulling a lot of uh, supply, a lot of demand forward. Do you worry about 
subsequent to this that there might be a, a drop off? Maybe start with you, Jesse. Yeah, I think um, there's definitely going to be some pull forward of demand for food, I think. And so on the back end of that, there's only so many mouths and a, a given rate of how many much people can eat. So I can't imagine there won't be a drop off in the future. Uh, for the moment now, I think, though, that's that's a secondary concern because it seems plausible that there could be empty grocery shelves in a matter of weeks, um, which, frankly, I'm concerned about causing panic. And I would rather pull demand forward, even if even if we give up sales later. And then obviously, I think we're all every small business owner is looking at their balance sheet a little more to make sure they're going to be around in case they have to go through a you know 50 day period with no sales. You've got a you've got a business that's probably pretty well built for something like this because it's dried uh, protein that you can store for an extended period of time. So, does that you, you're doing fairly well through this through this period at the moment? Yeah, so far I think the, um, I mean, to be clear about it, the demand is is through the roof and it's going to be through the roof for a while. What we're entirely focused on now is the supply chain, and just like someone was saying, one thing in the supply chain slips and we can't make the product. And we don't know when that's going to be or what that trigger will be. Yeah. So it, so it seems uh, it seems like a bad move to be cautious now with manufacturing because at any any point a, a link you don't anticipate breaking could break. Right. So we're we see very little risk in building up inventory. Usually at this point in the season we're we're taking inventories down. We're basically building inventory like we're going into the Christmas season right now. Yeah. Ariel, you you're seeing something similar. I'm seeing something similar, and it's going to be Christmas for everyone for a long time in the food business, and that's we don't know if UPS, FedEx, any of these guys are going to be able to support it. We know Amazon can, but they never had a 60-day Christmas craze, and and that's the part that, that we're thinking. We were actually ramping up production like we've never done before. We got into almost every stadium that we wanted to in the country. We were starting with baseball. We were ready for the uh, and NBA, NHL, we're ready for all the sports. Everything was lined up. So we started doubling production since the beginning of the year, tripling since the end of last year. But three weeks ago, we decided to bring to start bringing it down. We built a lot of inventory. We know our product holds great. It is actually now, I said, a direct to consumer item. It's perfect. You can get 24 of these things. It works great. Uh, so we're also not concerned with inventory risks. But, uh, and all of these will actually eventually come up, but we should all be concerned because we don't even know if, if our clients will be paying, even the large clients. We don't know what's gonna happen. I mean, I, I am at convention centers, fortunately they keep sending their checks, but they're shut down. Uh, they, so I'm sure they're gonna continue to honor them, but uh, everything is up for grabs. So we're doing everything we can on our end, not to be the responsible party to break it, but you can watch everyone. Scott, what, what do you think? In my head, I'm trying to draw parallels between now and, and the recession period. And um, it's two different, totally different scenarios. In the recession period, our products did fantastic because people stay home and they want to organize their home. And that's what our products are for. Uh, same thing now um, in terms of people staying home more and potentially that helps our products. But it's a different animal. This is not necessarily an underlying economic scenario yet. Um, it's more of the, the threat of the virus. So it's a, I really don't know what to expect. I think there's going to be a, frankly, some oh shit moments that we're all going to experience. Um, and I don't think any of us can pinpoint quite yet what those are, but, uh, they're certainly lingering out there and, um, we'll just see what happens. John, the gold price has been pretty strong over the last little while, although it seemed to sell off right into this crisis. Do you have any thoughts on the demand from your perspective? You know, the uh, during the 08 the, the credit crisis, you know, anything with a bid got sold. So I was, it was kind of funny. I was actually in New York trying to raise money for a fairly large acquisition of an underground mining company while people were taking pictures off the walls and loading cardboard boxes and they were shutting down. So I, while I realized the thing that I thought was going to happen, it happened, the, the reaction, the ramifications of it, I had completely wrong. I didn't think anything with a bid would get sold. I think that's a little bit of what you're seeing right here in the gold market right now. I've talked to a couple of guys that are on the physical side and they said the demand on the physical side is quite high, but the paper side is completely different, kind of disconnected. You know, we built our business when we started 
when when Grant and I decided to turn New Jersey Mining Company into a uh, producer, uh, gold was 1080 an ounce, and we built the business for 1200 bucks. You know, 1100 to 1200. I didn't care if it went up as long as we had a business at that point. I'm fine. And so we, you know, we did a lot of heavy lifting when it was when it really sucked, quite honestly, and it was really hard. So I think anything right in here. I I do think. We put out a press release earlier, I can't remember when it was, where we talked about when gold hit 1400, it's signaling something different out there than I believe it's signaling something different than it used to, um, whether it's monetarily, whether it's store of values, whether whatever. And I, um, I think these are good prices. I honestly right here, I don't really care if it stays flat right here or goes up. I don't like to see spikes in anything. I mean, nobody can run a business in a spike. So really what we need is sort of flat and boring and profitable. What, what does 1400 indicate? I, I, I wasn't quite sure, but I knew, I knew things were different. So it had kind of gone up to around 1350 for quite a while, and then it would drop back down, almost like clockwork. You know, when it hit 1400, I, I'm a bit of a student of the markets and kind of I've been since I was a kid. And um, it just seemed to me that things were – structurally different when you see it blow through 1350 hit 14 kind of keep going and um you know before in 08 when uh when the credit crisis hit you know gold was kind of high then but so were oil prices and interest rates were higher you know we don't have either one of those now um the balance sheets of the mining companies even the banks are completely different banks most for the most part are fortress balance sheets now so you add all that up and gold's going up while the dollar was going up also. Um, I don't know how to tell you what that means, but it is different. It's unusual behavior. It, it's We're rewriting the books here as we go, I think. Scott, you had something that you wanted to add there? Yeah, John, interesting point you made. So is the, the physical versus the paper, is the, is the paper seeing the sell-off that, that you kind of think it's seeing because of people grasping for liquidity versus the physical physical gold being bought and, and, and a, at a high demand for true investment purposes? I think so, yeah. I think that's right. You know, it's it's the thing that's easy. You know, you, you're not taking a bar of gold down to the coin dealer and trying to sell it. It's right. um, for on an individual basis. You know, it's it's – this little part of it here does remind me a lot of 08 when everything with a bid got a bid uh, or got hit. Um, but I'm actually surprised it's held in here really well. Now, a little bit along those lines, if you look at the silver market, and I am I am no expert on the silver market, but I've been really interested that I don't think silver is as much of a monetary metal or store of value as it used to be. I think a lot of that generation that believe that is kind of gone now. And so it's I really – just kind of glad we're in the gold business. Gents, I'd just like to ask you uh, what the government should do, if anything. So far, we've seen the Federal Reserve set interest rates to near zero. They fired the $700 billion bazooka on, over the weekend or on Friday, and then they've added another $500 billion to repo uh, this morning. Um, I that, haven't seen what the fiscal response is going to be, but there's precedent for like $1,000 being sent out or some sum of money being sent out a couple of times in the past. Do you think that's likely helpful, Jesse? Yeah, it's. Um, I just saw that Mitt Romney even came out and supported the $1,000 check to every adult citizen. It's pretty amazing that the debate has moved that far. I don't think that would have been on the table even two years ago. I don't recall that sort of uh, method be, being proposed in 2008 at all. Um, so maybe credit Andrew Yang with putting that into the... Uh, into the social conscious, but I think that I think that's likely to happen, and I think it would help. Certainly, the hourly workers, I think, would stand to benefit tremendously from that. Scott, yeah, I, I, I really don't know. Um, it's it's very interesting when we're trying to fix a uh, situation regarding health with with money, and I think the government's clearly just trying to get in in front of this the best they can from an economic perspective, but. Again, if there's no if no vaccine or no treatment truly for this comes about um, and things continue to 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 go up in the U.S., uh, North America, um, there's no amount of stimulus that's going to be able to to necessarily fix things. So I, I hope we're funneling money in the right places to, to help companies solve 
uh, this from a from a drug perspective. Um, but at the same time, obviously, anything the government can do for people um, to help them through this time is only uh, is only going to mitigate any of the significant harm that could result. What about from a regulatory perspective? Just just easing up on some things. Is there anything that would help you? Um, you know, it's been a very uh, good administration from a regulatory perspective for us. Uh, there's There's been a lot of easing over the last three years um, compared to prior administrations in terms of you know, various uh, environmental and, and other things that our products sometimes have to get tested for. So for us, uh, not so much on the regulatory side, I assume for these guys, there would be more of, of, of some of that, um, but not for us. Ariel? I have a, a different view on this and again the only because there's no vaccines it's about all of us staying home so while we need to help businesses uh, and i'm not talking about we've already closed our locations are smaller in the city and um, tourists disappear they shut down broadway but if people that works at restaurants don't know what they're going to do at the end of the month on march 31st we need to ease their mind but it needs to be immediately so I don't know all these packages and all these things they're saying they're going to do and, and then they don't do it that same day. It just keeps give, creating the panic on these people and all these employees that, that now no longer have work and they have a hard time reaching these social services. Phone lines are insane. Um, so whatever needs to be done, it needs to be done now all the way through this uh, through March 31st. So people know that on March 31st, they're going to be fine. They're not going to die. And that's kind of the concern. If they don't pay the rent on, on, Jan, on April 1st, they're going to be fine. But if they don't know that, then people are staying home and freaking out at the same time. So what we need to do is give them that calm so they could stay home purposely. They really should stay home. And I think we need to do more. I mean, I come from a country where we can teach a lot of people about crisis. When they come, they're severe and and things get ugly. Uh, this is we're not that prepared. Where are you from, uh, That's what, I'm from Argentina, and that's why I'm super <laughs> glad that South America have closed most of its borders. Our president, our president, the president of Argentina, was the first one to say, you know what? No more flights from Europe. No more flights from the U.S. Because everybody should be controlling their own problems, uh, and we should do it today. What are your thoughts, John? You know, when uh, Trump declared a state of emergency, I had emails from guys There were a couple of them, not in our company, but other people I know, and they were a little freaked out. And I said, no, I don't think you understand. That's the step. Like, that's the first step to saying, okay, everybody kind of gets it. They're going to do damn near anything they need to do to help. And I was talking to a couple other guys this morning about this also. And I said, you know, back when I was a kid, declaring a state of emergency, you just never happened. I mean, you never did it. Now we... Good or bad, we do it. We'll do it quick enough so we can get in front of the problem. And uh, I, you know, the thousand bucks a month. I think, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, I just don't know if that's the, that's gonna, that's what is needed. I think more of a targeted approach in different industries. And I think even if it's a, you know, if a company has debt payments coming up or whatever, or mortgage payments you know, add, add a couple months to the end of the term and call it good for a while. Like give yeah. people that right there. It's not, not the end of the world that way. And I, and one of the other things is I really hope I was hoping after 08 that um, we would come in and do this massive infrastructure build and prepare ourselves for the next hundred years. And we didn't. And I think this is the universe telling us, here's your second chance to get this right. Come back and get us set up for the next hundred years. And I'm really hoping that's what comes out the other side of this. Uh, just along that same vein, this will be the second last question. I just want to know what you guys are planning to change uh, in your businesses for the future. And then I'll just get your final comments. And uh, I know you're all busy. I'll let you go after that. But Jesse, what, what are you looking to change? Yeah, I, I think um, the, this crisis sets a new standard for what days on hand minimums need to be. From as far as planning for worst case. So, you know, everyone has to have a number in their mind about, well, what would the worst case be and how much would I need to have on hand to deal with that worst case? And I think there's a new high watermark now for our business. So we'll be we'll be changing our our inventory footing going forward to deal with things like this. Scott, any changes? 
I think I look at it from a cultural perspective, and I think this opportunity is going to allow <laughs> us the opportunity to to take some groups that all of our departments are very interconnected, which is great and not so great because uh, when people aren't here, it is a challenge. But I think this might give us an opportunity to kind of figure out how to go into the future, being able to uh, be as effective remote if necessary. Um, I think there's going to be some some silver linings there as it relates to how we're having to, to, to manage this. Ariel? Uh, as a business, I think this has brought us all together closer. And I think it's the empathy, the culture, uh, the realizing that it is, you know, we're all in this together. We're all ingredients in this world, so no matter where they're coming from. So I think it's it's going to be honing on on the culture and 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 us really hugging ourselves again at the end of this a lot more, a lot more empathy and not only worrying about our parents, but other people's parents. My parents don't live in this country, but I'm concerned for everybody's. And I think people are starting to gain some conscience that, hey, we're actually all in this together. And if people around you are not doing well, then you really cannot be doing well. So this country as a whole needs to start doing well as a whole. John, any thoughts? Um, actually, uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, I'm really hoping a lot more perspective comes in the media. And we, I, I'm just not a huge, I mean, I'm sure everybody's the same. I'm not a huge fan of the political situation on either side right now. It's, it's very, very annoying and I think very destructive. Um, and I think it's showing a younger generation the wrong thing. I, I can't stand it. Because, and I don't care what side anybody's on. I just can't stand that. But speaking of generations, I, you know, when I was coming up, the World War II folks were still around. So, you know, go talk to a guy that had, you know, stormed the beaches at Normandy about your problems. And I guarantee you um, he's going to have a little different perspective. And they, you know, they knew how to break down a challenge into a small piece and build from there and, and kind of quantify what's in front of them and don't, don't take on the whole thing at once. And, and that's really was one of my big takeaways. And really, I'm, I'm sort of glad. I said, I'm just so glad that these guys are, uh, that there's a younger generation that's, that's young and has the energy and that they're, they're going to have takeaways from this for the future. So when I'm 75 years old, I know there's a generation out there that can handle this stuff. Gents, I uh, really appreciate the time. Uh, why don't you just once again tell everybody your name and your business and how folks can support you uh, either through finding your website or, or uh, however they can go about helping your businesses. Uh, Jesse, start with you. Yeah, my name again, Jesse Coltis, co-founder of Lona Life. We manufacture dry bone broths. Um, best time to buy us or best place to buy us right now is probably on Amazon, but lonalife.com also works. I'll stick a link into the uh, show notes for this and uh, I eat Lona Life. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Toby. Scott. Uh, Scott Felsenthal, our company, again, is Whitmore. Uh, best place to learn about us is our website, www.whitmore.com, W-H-I-T-M-O-R.com. Thank you. Ariel? So our company is Nuchas. The best way to learn about us is also on our website, nuchas.com. This is what's coming to you uh, online, so you can actually order handheld foods, nuchas, in your house. I was prepared for this. Are those empanadas? <laughs> These are nuchas. They're handheld foods of the world, or as we like to call them, the evolution of handheld foods. We were actually going to start in a few stadiums, uh, so we were so excited that we're going to get finally America to understand what these are. These are not from Argentina. These are food from us. Um, so you can see that in our website, nuchas.com. We're going to be launching our own online store, shop at nuchas, shop.nuchas.com probably starting tomorrow or Wednesday. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. And I think one more thing I want to add, I, it's, like, it's going to be hard, but I really hope like with any other mistakes that, that get made, we all really learn and take something from this that is much more important than March 31st, our own well-being, and it's, we have just one place to live in. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Thank you. Uh, John? Uh, my name is John Swallow. I'm CEO of New Jersey Mining Company. Uh, we have uh, a junior gold producer in North Idaho. You know, the thing I would look at is I hope folks would take a look at even like their portfolios and just look at things that are an actual store of value, regardless of the medium of exchange or whatever, and really, really focus on that. Um, not to dive all in on anything, but really take a look at that and 
maybe not pay as much attention to the talking heads. John, uh, you're publicly listed, aren't you? What's your ticker? Oh, it's uh, NJMC, Nancy, John, Mary, Charlie. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, we're we're uh, we're the the dreaded penny mining stock. So, uh, but, but you're if a you producer. actually look at our yeah, we're a producer, one of the few. And if you look at our chart, we believe it or not, we've held in there better than the Dow. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. That's great, gents. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate the time. Um, we'll get this out as soon as we can. So hopefully this will be out this afternoon. And uh, I wish you all the best in your businesses. Thank you, Toby. Thanks, Toby. Right. Thanks nice talking, guys. Thanks, Toby. Thank nice meeting you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.